or symbol like MCAT or uh, another FreeBSD developer, uh, Valesa called Soka, has a high speed encrypted transfer protocol, uh, is because we need to orchestrate the ZFS commands. In particular, you know, you do ZFS send, it's a one way protocol that has, there's no reverse communication. Uh, so we need to be able to run the right commands to receive it on the other end. Uh, and because we're transferring snapshots at a 15 minute interval with multiple data sets, sometimes it's a lot of commands that have to be run in rapid succession. Uh, and we're trying to orchestrate, you know, run that cat on a port and then try to connect the right ZFS to the right one, which was a lot more complicated than just using SSH. Uh, and we use that, uh, ZFS replication for both pushing up to mirrors, but also for backing up over our private point to point links. Uh, which actually is two different problems as far as performance goes. So our main, uh, or one of our first use cases is ZFS replication over the LAN and uh, the metropolitan area network. So we have servers that have hundreds of terabytes of storage uh, full of important customer data, and we need to have more than one copy of that. Uh, while we tell our customers, you know, we're not necessarily the only copy of your data. You should have your own copy. The problem is that it could take them weeks or months to re-upload that data if it was all to go away suddenly. Uh, and that would be a very bad <coughs> business impact for them. So we have to keep uh, backups of huge amounts of data. Um, and it's important that we also track what was deleted and so on. So regular backups are slightly more complicated. And ZFS replication works best for this. Uh, so in this case, data is pulled uh, from the production server to the backup server uh, by the backup server SSH into the production server. Uh, and you'll see why pull versus push comes into play a little bit later. Uh, so recently we upgraded a lot of our LAN connections from one or two uh, single one gigabit connections to 10 gigabit, uh, and that's introduced a whole new set of problems. Or bottlenecks, we didn't know we were actually there because we weren't quite running into them yet. Then our metropolitan connection is a one gigabit point to point link. Uh, it's very low latency, 0.2 milliseconds or so for the uh, link from between cities. Uh, so while the latency is very low, it's enough to make a difference in the performance. Uh, the advantage in this case is that we control both sides of those connections, and they're both our FreeBSD. So if we come up with some patches, we can play it on both sides, and it'll work. The second uh, use case we have is ZFS over the internet. This is where we're publishing data to other servers. Uh, whether this is replicated caches, or the PC or TrueOS packet repo, or whatever. Uh, so this we use to move specific data to a server uh, often on a different continent than the source. Uh, so in this case, we pull from the receiver. Uh, the choice of that is mostly based on, as we'll see later, that pulling is faster by default in SSH. Uh, but bandwidth delay product becomes uh, a big deal here when you're pushing from Toronto to Germany or Toronto to Australia versus from Toronto to Hamilton, which is you know, 100 kilometers away. Uh, as we get higher speeds, it takes more work to actually be able to get those levels of performance out of SSH. Uh, so, you know, Toronto to Germany is about 100 milliseconds, and uh, Toronto to Melbourne is almost a quarter of a second. Uh, again, though, both ends are FreeBSD, so we could use a custom client and server uh, in this case if that would make a difference. Um, our third use case is for our recording service. So when people send a live stream, like the one that's happening here uh, for AJPSDCon, on our server that's receiving that stream, we're recording it. Uh, and then we have an rsync process that syncs those recordings back to our central storage servers, uh, where we have more space than we have on the random recording server uh, in Singapore that this is streaming to. Um, where this gets complicated is our video transcoding rigs, which take the incoming live stream and make down sample versions of it, uh, so that you can stream it on your cell phone or whatever, or a, a weaker internet connection. Those have to run Linux. And I really don't want to try to build a custom version of SSH on Linux and manage packages for that. Uh, 
So for this case, we would very much prefer to avoid having a custom client and have something that will work with the stock SSH. And in this case, we're pushing data. So the client, uh, the Linux server, is pushing the data to a FreeBSD server rather than pulling it. And uh, that comes into play, killing all the performance. And then our last one is our customers. Uh, they upload data to us uh, so that we can distribute the video for them. And they often do this over SFTP or SCP, uh, rsync over SSH. Uh, and we want to offer them good speeds for us to receive the data. If we're advertised as a CDN that has all these hundreds of gigabits of capacity and is going to ship their videos very fast, it looks really bad when they're trying to upload to us and they're not saturating their connection. Uh, but in this case, we have no control over the client side. Uh, so we have to do what optimizations we can only in the SSH server. So, HPN. There's a set of patches that were first introduced in 2004 called High Performance Networking, and it tried to deal with some of these problems of SSH. Uh, in particular, back in 2004, the default, uh, default SSH window size, because SSH manages its own window separate from TCP, uh, was 64 to 128 kilobytes. The idea is that if you, you know, catch a very large file on your SSH session, you want to be able to hit Control C and make it stop, and not have that take a long time to, to happen. Uh, so while that works great for interactive sessions, when you start trying to do bulk data transfer, having that tiny window means the bandwidth delay product potential of your connection is very small. Uh, so the HPM patches try to deal with this by introducing dynamic window scaling. If your session isn't interactive, it decides to have a bigger window than that. Uh, the problem with that is it only worked if you had HP, the patch, HPM patch on both sides, the client and the server. Uh, if you only had it on the one side, uh, it would default to a larger window of two megabytes, but that was it. Uh, of course, in uh, 2007, OpenSSH changed their default window size from 120K to two megabytes, so that bit of the patch doesn't actually make a difference anymore. Uh, what we found, uh, the, the biggest difference, is another feature in the HPM patches, which is the TCP receive buff. You basically, uh, if you're the client and you're pulling from the server, you can ask SSH to set sock opt and set your receive buff to an arbitrary size. Uh, you're still bounded by what the OS will let you do, so some tuning may be required, but you know, when the server in Germany wants to pull from Toronto, if it uh, it does set sock opt and ask for a 16 megabyte SSA, or, uh, TCP window, all of a sudden uh, it can actually saturate the gigabit connection between uh, Toronto and Germany. So while it greatly increases speeds when you're downloading, if you're the server in Germany and you're trying to push a recording back to Toronto, it doesn't work because you're only controlling the socket buffer on your side, not the other side. Uh, yeah, when it's the server, there's a setting in SSH that you can tune, but it's for all connections, not just the one you're trying to do. So yeah, transfers on the LAN were relatively fast, but even uh, that isn't able to saturate that 10 gigabit link with zero latency, right? Just two servers in the rack, back to back. You can't saturate the 10 gigs. Uh, some of that is the crypto, but even as you'll see later, when we remove that, it wasn't necessarily good. Uh, but we try to do it over the internet. So if you add even just 10 milliseconds of latency, right, not going very far, that won't even get you from Toronto to Chicago, uh, and use a four megabyte socket buffer, which is double the default on FreeBSD of two megabytes, uh, the theoretical maximum capacity of your link is only 3,300 megabytes, or megabits. Uh, if you use NetCat, you can just about reach that, and you can actually saturate the, the potential of the connection. But if you use SSH, it tops out at about 160 megabits because of the fixed uh, clock buffer. Uh, with HPN, if you're receiving, you can get about a little more than a third, almost half of that, 1300 megabits. But when you try to send, you end up just like regular SSH, tapping out at about 175 megabits. Of course, if you try to go to Germany and ramp that up to 100 milliseconds, uh, the floor falls out from under you, and bad things happen. Uh, with a four megabyte socket buffer, the theoretical capacitor link is now only about a third of a gigabit. 
And so if you don't have a bigger socket buffer or you can't get SSH to grow the socket buffer, you can't get even a third of the connection you have available to you. Ah, and again, with the default SSH socket buffer or uh, window being two megabytes, you're looking at half that. So 175 megabits is what all you're going to get between Toronto and Germany just because of the delay. Uh, however, if you try stock SSH, uh, you'll be surprised when you actually only get about 10 megabits between Toronto and Germany on the gigabit link you're paying for. And you're very upset. Uh, with HPN, you tune up uh, the receive buff and so on, and you can actually receive about 180 megabits. Uh, but again, when you try to send, you get the same results as SSH, only about 11 megabits. Uh, now, if you crank up your socket buffer to a very large 32 megabytes, uh, then you can get a bit better. Uh, with HPN, you can actually saturate the gigabit. Uh, but that's, if you actually have 10 gigabits between the two sites, you'll notice that you're, uh, you still only get a bit of because you're actually running into a different limit. And you're not getting the theoretical capacity of about 2,700 megabits if you have a 32 megabyte socket buffer. So if you're looking at 100, megabits, or 100 milliseconds latency, you realize how big of a socket buffer you're going to need to actually try to saturate 10 gigs. Uh, so like I said, we found it necessary to use the TCP receive buff setting to basically force the TCP socket buffer to be very large uh, in order to get any performance out of SSH at all. Uh, when we looked into why, we determined that the dynamic window scaling that's supposed to grow the TCP socket buffer to its natural uh, equilibrium wasn't actually working. Uh, during both HPN and non-HPN connections, uh, we see the TCP uh, window never seems to grow beyond about 256 kilobytes. So we figured out why. Uh, so there's a function in SSH called channel check window. Uh, and what it does is look at how much data has been transmitted and how much of the window is consumed and decide when to tell the other side I'm going to grow the window. Um, the way it does it right now is that each time half of the window has been consumed, it sends a window update saying, hey, I have more space available in the window, please send me some more data. Uh, in version 4.7 of OpenSSH, they added an additional check that says, if we've sent more than three times the largest packet, which is 32 kilobytes by default, uh, then move the window forward. So we actually move the window forward every 128K, not every half the socket buffer. Uh, and not entirely sure why, but this seems to cause the window to never really grow beyond a little bit more than 128K. Uh, and the performance you get is quite terrible. With that. Uh, so what the HPM patch tries to do what the HPM patch tries to do uh, is grow the SSH maximum window size in order to keep pressure on the TCP socket buffer and keep growing. So it uh, increases the SSH maximum window size by one and a half times the difference between what the current size of the socket buffer is and what the maximum of the SSH window is. Uh, I don't know if the behavior is different on Linux, it's something I still need to test, but on FreeBSD, the TCP socket buffer is never going to grow larger than the SSH window because the SSH window is dating how much data we're sending. So the socket buffer can't ever get bigger than the, amount, the maximum amount of data that SSH will try to send. Uh, and so we're never applying pressure to the TCP socket buffer. Uh, we could probably have pressure from the initial starting point of like 32K, right? Uh, your send buff. Uh, but it's never going to grow beyond the most amount of data we ever try to send at once, or to keep in the buffer. Uh, and since the socket buffer never actually exceeds the maximum window, we never grow. Uh, so I changed the if around a little bit, check if the connection is interactive. If it is, we keep doing the if we've already sent more than three packets, grow the window and keep the session fast and interactive in a, a small buffer. But if the session is not interactive, uh, we now change the logic to grow the TCP socket buffer, or rather, sorry, grow the SSH window size as soon as the socket buffer is consumed more than we have consumed out of the SSH window. Uh, 
Uh, so now we keep growing the SSH window size uh, to keep pressure on the TCP socket buffer. So we keep trying to send more data as long as the socket buffer is still growing. Uh, and by doing that, we can force the TCP socket buffer to actually grow to either the maximum it needs to achieve the potential bandwidth or the limits imposed by the operating system. And with this, we can actually transfer bulk data to another continent at reasonable speeds. And the diff is like restructuring a three-line diff statement and adding uh, a call to get socket opt to see how big the TCP socket buffer is. So with that fix in place, SSH can both send and receive at reasonable speeds now, uh, if you have the patch on both sides. If you have the patch on one side, it only works in one direction, but uh, we have another fix to try to deal with some of that as well. Uh, so even if you have a high bandwidth delay product, because we're keeping pressure on the TCP socket buffer, but only in the case where it's a non-interactive session, uh, we actually let TCP do the work instead of SSH trying to pretend to be TCP, and all of a sudden it actually works like it's supposed to be. Uh, don't quite get the speed to get with Netcat. Um, it seems to, because we're growing the TCP socket buffer, once we've consumed half of the TCP or the SSH window, we only seem to ever get to about half the potential. Uh, when I tried doing 75%, the high latency meant that we'd run out of window on the sender before we could receive the update to the window. Uh, so <clears throat> trying to grow, trying to push too much at once meant the latency that we didn't tell the other side to keep sending and we'd stall every once in a while when we'd run out of uh, unconsumed uh, SSH sliding window. Uh, but we find that the setting the TCP receive buff option is still better because rather than waiting for the OS to auto-grow the socket buffer to its maximum, which can take about two to four minutes uh, of increasing the TCP on each round trip, uh, especially if your round trip is 250 milliseconds, it takes quite a while to do enough round trips to grow the socket buffer all the way to 16 or 32 megabytes that we allow. So just manually specifying start at 16 megabytes for your send buffer or receive buffer is, is quite helpful. So we wanted to extend that further uh, to allow our video recording servers to push data to our storage server. So we created uh, the opposite of TCP receive buff, remote receive buff. Uh, the client can request that the server set its receive buffer to a larger size. Uh, there's a new config option that gates what the maximum of that is, and it's still gated by what the operating system will allow. You know, current dot IPC dot max octa. Uh, but uh, in the SSH protocol, there's a range of protocol numbers uh, reserved for local modifications. I took one of those and created a new command to say, hey, server, please set up a bigger receive button. Uh, so a little command line option on the sender, and you can say, server, set a big receive buff, and now you can get the full transfer speeds at the beginning of the connection instead of two to four minutes into the connection. This makes a big difference for us because we're sending 15 minute snapshots of ZFS. Sometimes those are very small, but we have 20 of them. And waiting for the TCP socket buffer to grow each time, we don't really want a slow start. Uh, and combining those gets more complicated. So just forcing the socket buffer to maximum rate of beginning allows us to check those changes out to servers far away uh, much more quickly. Uh, I copy up with that. There are two different sets of tuning knobs for the socket buffer. There's the maximum of the size of the socket buffer, and then there's the controls for the automatic growing of the socket buffer. If you have mixed use cases on your server, like we do, on our edge servers, we're doing a lot of uh, TCP connections for HTTP. Uh, for video, there are small chunks of video being requested constantly. We don't want to allow each client to have a 32 megabyte socket buffer. That would end badly. You know, someone would figure that out and very quickly knock the server over. So while you want to tune your automatic uh, socket buffer down a lot, you can tune your maximum socket buffer up and then use the TCP receive buff and remote receive buff options to allow this one connection to have 
uh, a higher socket buffer. So connections created uh, to the web server will use the auto tuning. Uh, and that's limited to a very small socket buffer, maybe even less than the default two megabytes. Uh, whereas for the SSH connections, we allow set socket up to have someone request the socket buffer of up to an arbitrarily large size, even 64 megabytes, uh, to be able to saturate long fat connections. So when you're playing with the SysCTLs, uh, you want to watch out for these. Uh, so TCP send space and receive space control the initial amount of the socket buffer. Uh, and then you have um, send receive buff auto, which enable or disable the automatic growing of the socket buffer. Uh, you probably want that on unless you know that you want one fixed size always. Uh, and then there's the maximum, which controls how high it will eventually allow the socket buffer to grow, and the increment, which is how much to grow it in each step. Uh, but rather than using these for your you know, specific SSH workload, you can use so, uh, set sock off and set a very large one. And instead, just tune up your uh, max sock buff, which is the limit of how much you can request, uh, while leaving the auto tuning set low so that your web server won't hand out giant socket buffers. The other caveat is that max sock buff is the maximum amount of memory consumed by the socket buffer not the actual size of the socket buffer. So if you set this to 64 megabytes and then tell SSH to use 64 megabytes, it'll say, I can't allocate a socket buffer that big. Uh, the buffer consumes uh, about 256 bytes of overhead for every 2K of data. So if you want a 64 megabyte socket buffer, you have to set max socket buff to at least 72 megabytes. Uh, that's the mbuff overhead. So that's it for the dynamic window scaling part. Is there any questions about that? Yeah. Um, are there similar config options on Linux? I guess there are. Uh, so if they have the HPM patch, the, oh, you mean these? Yeah. Uh, yes. They have <laughs> much worse names. <laughs> they just have random letters like W. <laughs> so, oh, okay. So I, I don't know if you can actually control the increment size on those. Uh, uh, you've talked about scaling up the window size. Is there also a facility for scaling it down with latency or packet loss for reason? Uh, for bulk data transfer, you don't care so much. Uh, and we specifically never grow the socket buffer at all if uh, it's an interactive session. Right? Because we don't you want that to always be responsive and not have a lot of data queued up that you're gonna have to wait for uh, before you can get a responsive terminal again. Uh, TCP can still, you know, decide not to send more data because there's too many packet loss over there. Uh, they can it, basically this set of changes that allows your congestion control algorithm to make the decisions instead of SSH. Uh, and uh, for congestion control, we currently use the HTCP uh, pluggable congestion control. Uh, in FreeBSD rather than the default. I uh, just find it works better for transatlantic uh, workloads. Okay, so now I'm getting into the slightly more controversial bit of how to actually saturate your 10 gigabit LAN uh, using SSH. Uh, so SSH, uh, the HPM patch also introduced a feature called the NUN cipher, uh, which basically, uh, as part of the command line invocation, you could request that when we set up the connection to this other server, uh, after we've logged in all encrypted and everything, once we're actually running the command that's going to be run, uh, switch the rekey the encryption to use a null cipher uh, so that the data going, say, from a ZFS send typed in ZFS receive uh, will not be encrypted. Obviously, the advantage of that is you're not burning all your CPU encrypting data that is, you know, the PCB is there, true OS. Uh, package repo is going to be public anyway. Uh, when CPUs were a lot slower, that made a big enough difference that it was actually required sometimes to saturate a gigabit. And on maybe some Atom server, maybe it still is. Uh, so we tried that, and it worked reasonably well. But uh, we found that it still wasn't there. Uh, 
So the null switch or the none switch feature has a uh, number of protections to make sure it can never be used for an interactive session and that you can never get a shell with it. Uh, because you know, at that point somebody can see the password you're typing or some whatever commands you're running. Uh, so it tries very hard to make sure that you can never use no encryption for an interactive session, only for bulk data transfer. Uh, but it's been made very clear that upstream OpenSSH will never accept this patch, and that's why it does. Uh, we've had it available in uh, FreeBSD ports for a while. Uh, so we've been using that uh, to avoid wasting CPU on public data for quite a while, uh, and it works reasonably well, especially over the LAN, uh, because removing the encryption and decryption uh, from the pipeline saves a lot of CPU, and at, you know, with slower CPUs, we require to actually saturate even one gigabit. Uh, so that was how we were doing it. However, when we started switching over to 10 gigabit, we found that even no encryption was still seeing SSH hit 100% CPU usage and gaining our connection speed. Uh, so you know, without the patches that we just talked about, HPM didn't uh, do much for us other than providing the node separate. Uh, see that. An interesting thing we found is that some modern uh, crypto algorithms like AES GCN are actually faster than the null cipher uh, because of the MAC, the message authentication code, uh, which is the bit added to the encryption stream to make sure that in flight no one's modifying the data, which is maybe even a bigger concern when you're doing no encryption at all. You want to make sure that the data you're receiving hasn't been modified. But it turns out that the Mac, uh, used by default, UMAC64, which is the fastest of the ones available in SSH, is still a lot slower than using AES-GCM, which is what's called an authenticated cipher, when in one pass you encrypt and provide a Mac for the data. Uh, it can actually achieve much better performance than the gun So in most cases, you should just use that. Uh, but uh, as we'll see, even with a very high-end CPU, uh, you still can't saturate 10 gigabits using ADS. Uh, so, in order to do all the things to figure out what to do here, uh, I checked out two systems from the FreeBSD test lab at Centex in Canada. Uh, so I got the machines Meerkat 5 and 6, which are uh, single socket E5 1650s. Uh, so these are the one-way CPU that has a higher clock speed but a lower core count than, for example, a 2650, uh, which is what most people use. Uh, so this gave me a much higher uh, clock speed than uh, the servers I had at work, which are all 2620s and 2630s. Uh, this provides about the best performance you're going to get on a, on a server with SSH because it's single-threaded, so your clock speed is the biggest factor, not the number of cores. Uh, so these have six cores plus hyper-threading. Uh, I disable Turbo Boost for most of the performance testing because it varies. Uh, although, I did do one set of tests with it enabled to show that you can get quite a bit of extra performance out of it. It's just, it fluctuates based on the temperature of the CPU and a bunch of other factors. Uh, they have 32 gigs of RAM, and they have uh, pair of dual port 40 gig Chelsea mix connected back to back. Uh, so by using a 40 gigabit uh, connection between the servers, I could see how much beyond 10 gigabits it might be possible to get. Uh, I ran FreeBSD 11 uh, release, and uh, <coughs> that includes OpenSSH uh, 7.2 in base. I also installed uh, the OpenSSH that portable from FreeBSD ports with the non cipher option and the HVN option. Uh, so from ports that was 7.3 P1. And then I have the version of that that I patched uh, with the fix for the dynamic, dynamic window scaling and uh, the new features I added. So uh, by default, uh, OpenSSH is switched to the Cha Cha 20 Poly 1305 cipher, uh, which is actually the slowest. Uh, because it doesn't benefit from the AES and I offload. Uh, I understand why they chose that. They wanted something not as related to the US government and so on. Uh, and for an interactive SSH session where you're not high performance, it makes perfect sense. Uh, 
Uh, the other reason we chose this is the support for it doesn't come from OpenSSL, it's built into SSH. So you can build a version of SSH with no OpenSSL by only supporting this uh, cipher. Uh, but when you're trying to do 10 gigabits, even with a 3.5 gigahertz CPU, you can't even get 2 gigabits out. Uh, it's quite slow. Uh, with AES uh, CDC, we could get, uh, with 256, it's only about 2,500 megahertz or megabits. But uh, with AES128, CDC, you get about 3 gigabits. Uh, with CTR, you get up to about 5 gigabits. The MEM cipher, uh, even though you're not doing any encryption, the MAC uh, limits the speed to about 5,800 megabits. Uh, whereas ACS, uh, AES GCM can do almost 10 gigabits, 9 gigabits uh, if you use uh, AES 128 GCM. Whereas if you can deck cap with no encryption at all, you can get almost 20 gigabits uh, on a 3.5 gigabit CPU. At this point, you're basically gated by how fast you can copy memory around. <coughs> I have a question. Sometimes you show the data of Netcat. Did you change the Netcat inside code? No, it was stock Netcat on previous. Because uh, you can improve the speed of Netcat uh, a little bit change inside of Netcat. A Netcat is a little bit a small buffer. Yes. So if you change the buffer size to, uh, example, the two megabyte, uh, you can get a more uh, good result of Netcat. Uh, one of the other things I did in a later version of this patch is actually unify all the buffer sizes in SSH from a mix of 16K to 32K, and that leaked out about another 2 gigabits at the top end. Uh, so yeah, uh, the reason I did Netcat was I left it stock uh, just as uh, my control, basically. Uh, but yeah, you can get even more by using doing bigger chunks at a time and spending less time calling them copy and doing larger charts at once. Uh, so yes, I found that some of the newer crypto algorithms are actually faster than no encryption, which at first is counterintuitive, but you realize it's because of the Mac. Uh, yeah, modern hardware has the AES, and, uh, AES new instruction, uh, which offloads a lot of the work uh, with even newer um, with newer CPUs, there's also uh, a new instruction with, that's just a jumble of letters about this uh, that does the uh, multiply in place for GCM and actually improves the speed even more. Uh, so even though the data is not encrypted, there's still a Mac applied, and that's where the speed limit is. Uh, so we looked at removing the Mac. Uh, in our case, ZFS already has a checksum. Uh, so we're not worried about the data being corrupted accidentally uh, and less worried about somebody maliciously trying to tamper with the data. Again, the checksum will find it. Uh, the attack vector that is there is someone could do something to the ZFS send stream that might crash ZFS on the receiver. Uh, but that's not really a, or a threat. Or modify the data and the checksum. Well, they have to modify the checksum of everything in the tree, but yes, I suppose they uh -huh, can do that. I see what you mean. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but uh, the, the biggest threat there is somebody trying to crash or exploit the kernel on the receiver, and we're not that worried about that. Uh, so we consider the option of disabling the Mac entirely and, and having SSH set up a thing and then just have a completely clear stream after that. You know, if our other option is to use Netcat, then you know, SSH setting up the stuff for us is still worth the, the trade-off. Yeah, with the MEM cipher, even with uh, the turbo boost turned on, we could only get about six gigabits, whereas AES-GCM could do over nine. Uh, so we decided to add the non MAC option. Uh, so basically, it uses OpenSSL's null MAC in addition to the null uh, cipher, uh, and now suddenly we can get throughput of 15 gigabits per second uh, with SSH. Uh, we kept all the same safeguards in place so that the null mat can't be used with an interactive session or to get a shell or anything like that. Um, and the two, uh, originally I made it so they could only be used together, 
Uh, but then for experimental purposes, I actually changed it so you can use uh, the NUNMAC with the other ciphers in order to do some benchmarks to see is the speed of AES CBC actually gated by the MAC being done as well. And it turns out that that's in fact the case. Uh, so once we have the NUNMAC option, uh, we have no encryption and no MAC, uh, and then unifying the buffer sizes in SSH to get a little bit more performance and so on, we're able to get at least 80% of the performance of the unmodified netcat. Uh, and we actually saw that AES CTR uh, was only about 10% slower uh, than the non cipher, but it's because they're both constrained by the MAC that was happening. Uh, so once we uh, tested AES CBC and AES CTR with uh, the non MAC, we saw that CBC was actually about 40% faster on 1.8 bit. And, uh, 30% faster on 256, while CTR was almost twice as fast once you remove the MAC. So if we could find a faster MAC to put into OpenSSH, we'd get more speed out of all the various crypto ones, except for the authenticated crypto ones like ChaCha20 and uh, AESGCM. But uh, CBC and CTR could be 50 to 100% faster if we had a MAC that wasn't the bottleneck, and we just left the cipher as the bottleneck. So uh, once you combine those, uh, AES-128 can now do about 4 gigabits instead of 3. Uh, you see AES-GCM is at about 9 gigabits. Uh, AES-CTR can actually do slightly faster than uh, GCM, because uh, AES-CTR and AES-GCM are almost the same, uh, just the counter is slightly different in the GCM version, and you get the MAC out of it. Uh, but with the NUN cipher, uh, we managed to actually get all the way to 13 gigabits, uh, which gave me decent hope that I'd be able to saturate my 10 gigabit links uh, between my servers. Uh, so at this point, uh, I got to about the limit of what I could do to SSH to make it faster. Um, on the next slide, I have a D-trace flame graph. Uh, and basically what it shows is that at this point, all of the CPU time in SSH is spent in libc, doing memcopy, memset, or bi. Uh, in order to get more performance, I have to try to re-architect SSH for speed, and that's kind of not what I'm after. It's just trying to get a reasonable amount of speed. You know, I don't need to necessarily saturate the whole 10 gigabits. I would just like more than you know 160 megabits at <laughs> my 10 gigabit uh, you know, We're already abusing open SSH. I don't feel it necessary to go through and try to re-architect it for speed when that's not really the point of SSH. So here's the flame graph, and you can see that it's all mem copy, mem copy, mem copy, etc. Uh, so uh, in the paper you can see there's uh, charts showing how this scales with CPU speed because you come down to how fast you can do the mem copy. Uh, That's really what's the, the limit. Uh, so sadly, uh, this means that the 2630v4s I have at, at the office and at the, in the data center uh, can't actually saturate their 10 gigabits uh, because they can't move the data around quite quickly now. But they can get uh, quite a bit more performance than they had before. So in the end, I came out pretty happy. Uh, so hopefully, the dynamic window, window scaling bits uh, although originally I based them on the HPM patches, they're pretty separate from it. Uh, I'm hoping I can make a clean enough patch that OpenSSH might accept the change of, if it's a non-interactive session, put pressure on the TCP socket buffer. Uh, it ends up being a boat of four or five line patch uh, to the one function, and it's nice and isolated. So that one I have good hope of uh, being able to get upstream. The, uh, Manually setting the socket buffer uh, option from HPN. Uh, I know that HPN patches have previously been rejected, but I think part of that was they tried to do the whole set rather than the individual features. Uh, I don't have high hopes that uh, OpenSSH would accept the, uh, allow the client to set the remote socket buffer or request a remote socket buffer option actually going upstream. But if it can live as a patch in the FreeBSD ports version, 
that's good enough for me. And yes, the nun Mac I know is never going to go upstream, but maybe it can live uh, in the uh, port street as well. Uh, questions? Anybody? Sorry, where'd you all sleep? Um, are all your patches now in the as options available as options in the port street? Not yet. Uh, are all of the patches available in previous reports as options now? Not yet. Uh, most of them are up on my GitHub. I uh, cleaned it up a little bit and make it apply to the FreeBSD ports. So uh, Brian Drury changed the way that we deal with HPM in the port tree. Uh, he basically extracted it and reformatted it slightly so the if depths are cleaner. Uh, whereas upstream in HPM, they've gone slightly a different direction to try to show that their changes are smaller uh, to upstream SSH. Uh, so instead of having if HPN do this, otherwise do this, they have just like the middle of a broken up line is the if depth. Uh, so either I need to rebase my patches to apply to the way we have it in ports, or ports need to change back to using the upstream HPN set of patches. I'm not sure which one of those is the best. Um, Hopefully, a couple of things can go to upstream SSH, and then it'll apply to both that way. Uh, but yes, uh, I plan to try to clean it up and get it available to ports, and I'll just have a conversation with Brian Drury about which way he sees that working better. Uh, the reason he reformatted the patches is so that they apply more cleanly to upstream every time, especially since OpenSSH has been rototill once or twice lately, uh, as they've gone through and removed support for SSH1 and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and they've re-architected it quite a bit, and that made the patches require a lot of work to keep applying. And so Ryan simplified his pipeline for it, and I understand why he did that. So, uh, but not yet, but hopefully uh, in time for when I give this talk at BSD. Cool. Yeah, I'm just going to say, what's the time frame that you're going to try and get this done in? Uh, hopefully by April or May. Uh, well ahead of BSD now. Because uh, the other thing I'd like to test is, while I found that the HPN patches do not work on FreeBSD, uh, the dy dynamic window scaling doesn't function as it's supposed to, does it actually work on Linux? Because that's where they actually based the work originally. Uh, and if so, it's like, is the behavior of R get socked up to the size of the buffer wrong or just different from what everybody expects? Because it's not the first time I've wondered uh, even if you run like I mean, iperf3 uh, and it's running get sock off to look at the, the congestion window size, uh, on FreeBSD it shows giant negative numbers and on Linux it shows reasonable numbers. Uh, I'm just wondering if our behavior is actually slightly different than everybody thinks it is. Uh, so I'd like to look into that a little bit. Uh, the other interesting thing I found is the HPN patches had an experimental support for a multi threaded version of AESCTR. Uh, so they could use more of your cards. Uh, and while it still seems to work for them on their old, uh, like the Halem Xeons, on my new modern ones, I actually found that single threaded was faster than the way they were doing multi thread. Uh, so at first I tried, uh, by default, they only did like three threads, and, or two rather, because they had four cores to use. But I had 32 cores, and I really wanted to try more. So I, I tried actually making it use more, and adding more threads didn't make it any faster at all. Uh, something else is bottleneck there. So I have a, a bug open upstream the HPM patches to be like, well, either the multi-threading doesn't, something's not working like you think it is, or it just doesn't make sense anymore and we should remove it. But uh, if all of a sudden you could run two threads in AESGCM uh, and get 18 gigabits of encrypted, that would solve all my problems too. Uh, but the biggest takeaway is, if you're trying to do bulk data transfer with SSH, just add minus C AES-128 uh, GCM at OpenSSH.com instead of using uh, the ChaCha 20, and you'll get most of what you can expect uh, from your 10 gig instead of being limited to about a gig and a half. Uh, if you're just replicating between two get 10 gig machines in your rack, or just switching the cipher will give you enough of a speed boost to probably not care about trying to actually saturate your technique.
depends how many terabytes of data you have to move, whether it's going to make a big enough difference or not. Okay, thank you.